This is Salty's Flats, or Salty's Meadows if you're selling real estate. It's outside Spokane, Washington, just a few miles from the Idaho border. I grew up right over here. This all used to be wetlands until some ancestors of mine drained it in the 19th century. Luckily, at least this part is now being returned to wetlands as a wildlife sanctuary. This was filmed after about 18 months of work on the project, and already they're getting huge flocks of birds like nothing that ever came through when I was a kid. This is Bud. He's my grandmother's first cousin, making him my first cousin twice removed. I worked on his ranch one summer when I was 15, moving irrigation pipe and spraying carcinogenic chemicals. He's the one who has been working with the county to rebuild the wetlands here. As part of this, he thought I might want to do some art for the Interpretive Center. A theme I keep coming back to in my kinetic sculpture is... birds. There was my murmuration piece for the Vela Eastside Gallery, and in 2016 I attempted one called Hubris for Burning Man, but it didn't turn out great. Which was a shame, because the wing motion was surprisingly organic for such a simple mechanism. So that was my goal. Do the crankshaft design, but do it right this time. Damn it. After getting the basic design signed off on by my structural engineer, I outsourced the welding of the mounting flange onto the central column. That's the kind of thing that really, really needs to be done by a certified welder. I picked up the half-inch steel plate, which would serve for the bird body and gusset plates while I was at it. This was in early February, with installation scheduled for April. First up, getting a template for the mounting bolts made, to be sent over to Spokane so the concrete pad could be poured. I just clamped the plywood onto the flange itself and used a Forstner bit as a transfer punch, then drilled the holes out. Then it was time to start cutting out the bird parts. I used the plasma cutter I originally got for the Growing Together project. Slow going, but easy enough as long as I kept the tip clean, and didn't lose track of when I was directly over the welding table. After ten years, I finally marred the top surface. At least the vise covers most of the sin when it's mounted. The wing segments were each about 30 kilos. Heavy, but not quite unmanageable. The bird parts were meant to rust naturally, like a lot of my public art pieces. But I always like the look better when the mill scale has been removed first. Mill scale is itself an oxide, so it takes a long time to rust through evenly and nicely. I didn't want to deal with vinegar baths to remove it, though, since they're such a mess. So I tried using diamond wire wheels that I'd seen some other fabricators use. They're fast and leave a beautiful finish, but they're pricey. And you really need to use a variable speed angle grinder to extend their life. Which I got, but even on its lowest speed, they still degraded faster than I would have liked. And the broken wires coming off them were vicious. Cleaning up one night, I found one embedded two centimeters into my arm. So I'm not sure I'll bother buying any more, unless it's for a special project. I was originally going to clean up the plasma cut edges with a grinder. First I put this off as something that could be done later, and eventually I came to really enjoy the organic nature of the raw look in this context. I never did clean up the feathery edges, and I think it was the right call. I did want to clean up the hinged edges of the wing segments, however. This would provide a good datum against which the holes and other features could be positioned. I did this on the mill to provide a truly straight edge, and then drilled the series of mounting holes. The segments would be connected with a heavy-duty stainless steel piano hinge, most of which would be hidden on the top side of the wings. The connection to the bird body itself was done the same way, except here there was a hinge being bolted to both sides through the same holes. During all this, I was receiving a constant stream of deliveries from McMaster Car. It was time to get started on the mechanics of the thing, but my 2016 experience had taught me that I needed a way to test the mechanism on the ground in the shop so I could fix problems there rather than on site. The mounting column is four meters tall, however. That's way taller than my shop space. And even if I did it outside somehow, that's still taller than my gantry crane. I wouldn't have had a way to get the parts up there. Luckily, though, 
most of that height is just for visual effect and to keep the working parts of the mechanism up out of easy reach. So I could make a 2 meter tall test stand with a much shorter chain drive and still be able to test the full mechanism. I was a bit worried about it tipping over, hence the super wide base. Plus I left it attached to one of the gantry crane hoists most of the time for extra security. The drivetrain is pretty simple. The user turns a shaft at the bottom. This turns a 14 tooth sprocket, connected to a sprocket with 42 teeth on an intermediate shaft at the very top giving a 1 to 3 gearing reduction. Another 1442 tooth sprocket pair doubles back down, connecting to the crankshaft just below it. The crankshaft turns, the wings are moved up and down, and the bird flaps along merrily. This intermediate shaft solves two problems. First, it allows for a generous 1 to 9 mechanical advantage, which seemed important for letting smaller kids run the device. You don't usually see much more than 1 to 5 in a single run, just because one of the sprockets would have to be ridiculously big. This situation was even more constrained, however, because the ID of the post is just 8 inches, making a 42 tooth sprocket about as large as you'd want to go and leave some wiggle room, assuming standard number 40 roller chain. The intermediate shaft also allowed both chains to be accessed from the top of the column for assembly. I later ended up adding some access panels on the side of the post though, so that second point didn't end up as important as I was originally thinking. For the test stand, I used cheap ball bearings off eBay, so I could get started prototyping quickly. I always planned on using something more robust on the final product, and ended up choosing dry running bronze bushings. These were also flange mounted with spherical bushings to allow easier shaft alignment, but don't need to be kept greased. It's always best to assume public art will receive minimal maintenance in the long run. The plan was that the crankshaft would be connected to the wing segments through rod end bearings. Rod ends are standard industrial parts for doing more or less exactly this kind of thing, and they come in a wide variety of styles. Specifically, I used these externally threaded super swivel rod end bearings. Right hand threaded on the crankshaft side and left hand threaded on the wing side. This is done so that if you turn it to the right, both sides will... You know what? Screw it. We're doing a tangent. Everyone knows righty tidy, lefty loosey, yeah? I hate that saying. It's a bad mnemonic. I recently saw the right restricts while the left liberates, translated from Spanish. And while that's more fun, it's still fundamentally flawed. Using left-right to describe rotary motion just doesn't make sense. Here is a bolt turning to be screwed in, assuming a right-handed thread. By the above descriptions, it is turning to the right. And this part of it is, but this part of it is also turning to the left. And these parts are going up and down. Averaged over the whole bolt, those all cancel out to no motion at all. Which makes sense because, you know, bolts don't move in X or Y as you fasten them. They rotate and they move in Z along their axis, unless something very bad is happening. Stop using translational terms to describe rotation. A much better version is times getting tight. If the fastener is turning in a clockwise manner, it will be getting tighter. This is clearly the superior mnemonic. It uses a rotational term to describe rotational motion. It still gets a bit messy if you aren't directly facing the fastener, but overall it's a huge improvement. The superior option, though one that's admittedly somewhat more obscure, is to simply use the right-hand rule. This works for screws just as well as it works for vectors. Point your right thumb in the direction you want the fastener to go. The way your fingers curl around is the direction you need to turn the fastener in order to make that happen. This is particularly useful when working blind in some contorted position that's upside down and backwards. Skip doing all the coordinate transformations between your head and your hand, and just use the hand's physical geometry itself. It's also easier to apply this to left-handed threads. Simply use the left-hand rule. But speaking of left-handed threads, the reason each pair of rod end bearings has oppositely handed threads is that it allows you to insert a connecting rod later. If both sides had the same handedness, then turning the rod in either direction would only tighten one side while loosening the other. With oppositely handed threads, however, if you turn the rod clockwise, you're tightening both sides at the same time, and vice versa. This allows for much easier assembly, and also allows for fine adjustment of the exact distance between the two bearings later. 
the connecting rods were just aluminum hex stock, since hex stock is the second best stock, which I drilled and tapped on the lathe. Left-handed threads are cool, but they sure do confuse me every time I need to use them. Mounting the rod end bearings on the cranks would be easy, just a small section of shaft with some spacers to keep the bearing centered. The wings would need a yoke of some kind, however. Originally I was planning to bolt on a matching rod end clevis, but then I decided to make my own and weld them directly to the wing segments to keep them lower profile. I made these in a single loaf, since they're all slices of the same shape. The top didn't need to be perfectly rounded over, but once you know the trick of pivoting them in the vise around a shaft, it's pretty fun. The tessellated top surface was cleaned up on the belt sander, and the loaf was finally cut apart into eight yoke halves on the horizontal bandsaw. These were welded into place in pairs on each of the wing segments. The rod end was left freely rotating on the shaft, but captive as the shaft was welded directly to the yokes. I probably should have used snap rings so they'd be more easily removable. The crankshafts were the focus of most of my concern. The Burning Man experience had taught me the importance of counterweights in a mechanism like this. It's not enough to give people mechanical advantage in order to lift heavy wings. There will still be a kickback when the wings crest in their lifting cycle and start to drop back down. At that point, the crank, which had been trying to twist in one direction, will suddenly jerk to trying to twist in the other direction. It wasn't really acceptable on the playa, and it definitely wouldn't be for public art in the default world. Little kids would be using this thing. I had the crankshaft webs and extra counterweight bits water jet cut out of one inch stainless. This wasn't cheap, but I was already feeling the time crunch. And I really did want them to look as good as possible, as they're a very prominent aspect of the design. I cleaned them up, first reaming out the holes to be a perfect fit for the one inch shaft, then chamfering all the edges. These were heavy enough, I really didn't want any sharp edges when handling them. I also touched up the sides with the belt sander. The raw surfaces left by water jet cutting are fairly precise, but still a little rough to touch and have a distinct matte look that just screams unfinished to my eye. With those ready, I could start testing with real motion on the test stand. I really came to love this magnetic lifting clamp. Getting the wing segments into position for testing would have been an absolute nightmare without it. At first, I just tacked them into place, leaving the shaft running straight through between the webs. This meant the motion couldn't quite go a full 360 degrees, but it was close enough to convince myself it was working. I could actually lift the weight of the wing segment just by turning the input shaft by hand, with no crank attached. Promising. After one segment was working, I moved on to the second, but only after adding a mid-span bearing to the design, supporting the shaft between the two cranks. I was already seeing enough deflection, I was sure it would be needed. Convinced it was all working, the time came to finalize the first crankshaft. First, I welded everything together. The shaft still went straight through the reamed holes, helping keep everything aligned as best as possible. I originally thought I would then cut it out with a large angle grinder. I think that could have worked, but it would have been really messy and awkward. So instead, I took it into the vertical bandsaw on in the inner shop. You know, the one that almost fell on me when I was moving it in a couple years ago? I don't use it every day, but when I need it, I really need it. It wasn't fast, but I don't think he even noticed cutting through the one-inch stainless shaft. The thing is a beast. With the cranks opened up, all that was left was to hoist it back onto the test stand, reattach the wing segments, and see how it worked. The motion was a bit jerky due to how the drivetrain is assembled, but this is when I started to feel some real confidence in the project. They weren't quite in the critical path yet, but I did continue to work on the gusset plates during this period as well. These are mostly decorative, but I was glad to have the structural reinforcement for the support arms. I cut them out of the same half-inch steel plate as the bird parts. The two right angle edges I cleaned up on the mill to use as datums, then tacked the two pieces together. The curve wasn't critical, it just needed to look good. By ganging them together, I knew the results would match nicely. I ended up using the belt sander in a moderately unorthodox way, tipping it sideways and using the big contact wheel to grind in a nice curve. The two plates were so heavy I could only move them with any finesse by floating them on a wheeled platform precariously balanced on the welding table. But hey, it worked. Finally, I cut some lightning holes out of them. Again, this was mostly decorative, but this is art? 
This was done with a hole saw in the mill, followed by boring out to the desired diameter. This was very, very, very slow. You can tell how bored I was by the rather ridiculous number of different shots I got of the process. But I feel obliged to honor my past self's intentions by sharing them with you here. After all, I can only hope future me is equally generous to present me's ambitions. And if I have to guilt the bastard into doing what I want, so be it. The second crankshaft came together in much the same way as the first. Except for the critical mistake of forgetting to clock the keyway on the shaft to have the same relative angular relationship to the cranks as the one on the first crankshaft. There was much swearing. Without both sides sharing this angular offset, the wings wouldn't flap in sync with each other. Wing phase must be maintained. I could have cut another keyway on the crankshaft, but getting it set up true on the mill seemed daunting. It seemed a lot more reasonable to do this instead on the short shaft that went through the column, connecting the two crankshafts. But how to set it up on the mill with the correct angle relative to the keyway already cut on the other side? After a lot of thinking, I made this little widget with a keyway on one end and a large flat at 90 degrees to it on the other. By mounting this with a rigid shaft coupler, I could use an inclinometer to work out the relative relationship on the first crankshaft, then use it to set up the central shaft on the mill with the complementary angle. And it worked! With the crankshafts finished, the only thing left was to mount them on the test stand and hoist the wing segments up above them. And this also worked! However, even with the counterweights, there was a lot more backlash on the crank than I would have liked. It had been manageable with just one wing segment, but with all four, not so much. I thought about adding more counterweights, but I wasn't thrilled with the idea. Visually, it would be a disaster, and mechanically I wasn't too happy about adding yet more weight onto the shafts. I definitely knew it couldn't be a simple crank with its handle sticking out at right angles, ready to twist around out of control and break some kid's wrist. Okay then, a wheel. But spokes of any kind would be almost as bad from a safety perspective. It would need to be a solid disc with nothing that could catch, with some kind of smooth rim for grip. But at that point, what if it was a really big wheel with tons of rotational inertia to smooth out the backlash. Maybe cut out of that same half-inch steel plate I already had? So I mocked it up from cardboard, and it seemed reasonable. This idea actually helped solve another problem in my mind. How high should the crank be from the ground? For what age range a child should it be optimized? A big wheel meant it would always be reachable by anyone who could walk. Even if their parent had to do the real turning, it still made it interactive for the youngest kids, and I really wanted that. With the prototype looking good, I cut a 30-inch disc out of the sheet and tacked it into place. And suddenly everything just worked. The backlash was still there, of course, but the moment of inertia was so high the wheel just couldn't be spun up out of control. Not by the weight of the wings, and not by the user either, which I'd also been a bit worried about. Public art leads a rough life, after all. The motion was smoothed out, and I was just a lot happier about the whole thing. All the last serious question marks had been dealt with. The test stand had done its job, so it was time to take everything down and make room for the final work. First, all the mounting holes had to be drilled and tapped in the post. Sadly, I've yet to find the radial arm drill press of my dreams, so this would have to be done manually. And the truth is, I'm really bad at drilling holes manually. I can just never keep them perpendicular. There is a reason I always suggest a benchtop drill press is the first real shop investment people should make. Drill presses are, well, they're just the best. But since that couldn't be used here, I spent an afternoon making a drill guide. Just a chunk of aluminum with a V groove down one side, and a series of conveniently sized holes drilled through the center of the groove. It was a bit marginal for the 8.6 inch OD of the post, but it worked. I'm happy to say that none of the mounting bolts screw in at an embarrassing angle. Working on the post forced me to finally figure out how exactly the bird body would be mounted on top. It needed to be removable for transportation and, knock on composites, possible maintenance access. I wanted a cap that could bolt on, that overhung the sides of the post a little bit to reduce water ingress. I wanted it to be hell for stout, in case we decided we needed to hoist the whole thing by the bird body during installation. 
We did not, as the case turns out. And it should have a nicely tapered top to shed water better. Monolithic chunks of metal in that size are quite expensive though, so I ended up buying these 3 quarter inch offcuts from eBay, welding them together, and then spending an absolutely ridiculous amount of time turning them down on the lathe. This is the danger of larger diameters. The volume of material to be removed goes seriously non-linear. I had this monstrous pile of chips menacing me for weeks afterwards. I think the final result was worth it though, even if it did end up looking a bit like the world's largest screw head. The slot was where the bird body would later be welded on. The last major bit of fabrication were the support arms. I'd originally planned to reuse the ones off the test stand, but better understanding of just how heavy everything was made me want to rethink that and go with something beefier. So I switched to using 4-inch box tube with quarter-inch walls. To get these to fit the curve of the post, I first cut the ends with a 6-inch hole saw, the largest I could easily get. Then I used the boring head to open up that diameter until it was a good fit. This went a lot faster on the second one, when I could leave the boring head set at the right diameter and just walk it into the end of the tube. Alignment of the shafts was, of course, a big concern. This was for a low-duty cycle, low-RPM application, but still. I used another section of 1-inch shaft to align the bearing mounts, with some precision standoffs made on the mill to keep it parallel to the support arm. The bearing bracket at the end, made out of yet more half-inch plate, sealed off the end of the tube and could be welded on at whatever height was required. Next, the arms had to be welded onto the post, and the same shaft served the same purpose. Now it ran through the arms' bearings, and the bearings bolted to the post. That eliminated 4 degrees of freedom for the arm, making its alignment much, much easier. The arms were positioned using these little adjustable stands I made for welding up the ring segments on the Gimbal Maze project 9 years ago. It still took a lot of chasing the arrows around in circles, but eventually I iterated into a good solution with the arm perfectly level and perfectly perpendicular to the post, with the shaft keeping the bearings aligned. But I wasn't done with that one inch shaft which is good because that stuff isn't cheap. It was destined to become the grippable rim of the drive wheel. First, I decided the wheel was a little too big, so I made a simple compass attachment for the plasma cutter and cut it down to more like 28 inches across. Then, using the reference hole in the center as a pivot, I cleaned up the edges using the horizontal belt sander trick again. Finally, I stuck it on the mill to drill a bolt hole pattern for mounting it to this clamping hub on the shaft. Seven holes, because, of course, heptagons are the bestagons. The shaft was cut down into eight 12-inch sections, and then slotted with a half-inch end mill. Each of these could then be cut in two at 11.25 degrees to give 16 segments, forming a perfectly good hexadecagonal approximation of a circle for the rim. This took an evening to do, but it was much simpler than I was originally thinking. Instead of making a series of complicated jigs for the bandsaw and mill to make sure the beveled ends were aligned and the slot was cut perpendicular to them, I'd realized I could cut the slot first and then use that to clock the pieces in the bandsaw vise. Simple. After tacking the segments around the rim, I wanted to round over the vertices nicely. Feeling ambitious, I decided to do this precisely on the mill like a civilized person. This big old rotary table did the trick, and it was a fun setup, but it was really a waste of time. The welding wasn't that accurate, so there was a notable variation in the exact distance out to the vertices from the center. I still ended up doing the real cleanup with an angle grinder after welding. Oh well, I tried. After this, it was just welding on the gusset plates, which was a good thing because it was already April. I probably could have been done earlier, but I'm glad I didn't have to rush some of these steps. It's a conceptually simple project, but the scale of it alone really pushed the bounds of the shop. And my body, to be honest. In retrospect, I'm kind of shocked I never threw my back out even once. Those crankshafts are just about the most cursedly awkward things I have ever moved. It's hard to have a chain drive without a chain. Or two in this case. I keep a spool of number 40 chain on hand, so it was just a matter of counting out the links. A personal record of 522 for the long chain. Breaking and joining them back into loops with a connecting link is the same as with shorter, more sensible links of chain. It's just a lot trickier to wrangle the rest of the chain while you do it. 
I usually end up clamping it in a vise so I can use an angle grinder to cut off the rivet heads to make braking easier. With the chains made, final assembly of the drivetrain could happen. Keys were set in keyways, bearings were bolted down firmly, the shafts were all snap ringed and clamped into place, the chain drive was tucked away neatly inside the column, and the passive voice was used excessively. Anyway, a few coats of paint, a rented flatbed, and some lengthy and very damp loading of everything which I didn't bother to film, and it was time to head east to the homeland of my people. Installation went okay. A boom truck with a skilled operator definitely beats my normal fumbling around with a rented forklift. We got the post flipped around and the bird attached. After trying out a couple different rigging options, we flew the whole thing over to the mounting bolts and got it locked down without any problems. The relief I felt at seeing it slot down onto the bolts cleanly was immense. Not having the bolts and bolt holes quite match up is a trauma that only has to be experienced once to leave lasting psychological impact. But just as I thought the danger was past, this is where it all got a little bit bumpy. The main chain drive was very loose. Not quite unusably so, but a lot more than I would have wanted. We eventually decided just to leave it be for now until it becomes a real problem. Swapping out those sprockets isn't going to be easy. I think this happened because the calculator I used to work out the sprocket spacing just wasn't designed to be used on runs 3 meters long. It has some error factor or something inside that scales up linearly and just ends up being way too big on this scale. It had felt okay laid out horizontally on the shop floor, but that was with the sag in the middle taking up slack, so lesson learned. The other big problem was the shaft couplers. I had put in high torque spider couplers since I knew that my shaft alignment wasn't going to be perfect. I also liked the bit of extra cushion the rubbery bridge piece added to further smooth out shocks. But it wasn't high torque enough, causing the bridging piece to get shredded and jammed fairly quickly. This was fixable on one side with a higher torque bridging piece, overnight delivery. But the other side continued to have a problem. That crankshaft had warped a bit too much during welding, and it was just too much for the spider on that side when under load. And because everything was designed to not let the crankshaft slide apart, replacing them with different couplers would have meant removing the wing and the crankshaft entirely. Not something I particularly wanted to do 12 feet in the air, precariously balanced on a hay bale. But the original spider halves could be slid down the shaft to make room for a two-piece clamp-on rigid shaft coupler. It seems to be holding fine for now, but I might have to revisit this in the future. So, not a flawless victory, but victory all the same. The day after it was finally working was the grand opening for the Doris Morrison Learning Center, named after Bud's mother. And it was very well attended. There is a lot of interest in the community over the wetlands restoration, which is great to see. And once the kids discovered migration, it seemed to be a pretty big hit with them. As someone whose life trajectory was subtly but surely changed by experiencing a piece of interactive art as a kid not too far from this place, that was really the payoff for the whole project. <laughs>